Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, creator of the Body Kindness Philosophy book and audiobook. I'm here to help you create a better life by reinventing health from the body oppressive, shaming, and you'll never be enough type of mindset to positive and joyful ways that you can spiral up your energy, mood, and your well being at any size, shape, or weight, and as you are right now. Get started for free at bodykindnessbook.com slash start. That's the sound of me smashing a stack of scales in front of some friends. And I have to say that breaking up with the scale and all the other ways I was judging, monitoring, and measuring my worth was absolutely pivotal in my life. Creating the body kindness philosophy and letting myself be a human being again helped me become a better mom, a better clinician, and a happier and healthier person. I believe we all have a right to decide how we want to care for ourselves, and I think we all need support in figuring out what that looks like. You don't have to do this alone. There's a whole community of like-minded people who are fed up with diets, who are embracing intuitive eating, and who are completely redefining their lives from body shame to body kindness. You are not broken. Our culture is. Find your inner caregiver and create a better life with body kindness. I actually began some of the earliest research on this project in about 2007 or 8. Oh. And we have to keep in mind that this was the height of the obesity epidemic rhetoric. Right. Yeah. So the mid 2000s was really the time in which, you know, all of America was sort of on tenterhooks. We, you know, we have to figure out how to get all Americans to lose weight. And so here I am saying, oh, you know what? There might be an alternative history to <laughs> what we're describing. Um, yeah. It might not actually just be health concerns that is motivating this mm-hmm. terror. And yeah. you know, so people really did push back against that. It wasn't until maybe about five years ago that I started to see a significant shift. Yeah. Um, and so I do feel hopeful now that people are starting to think differently, like, wait a minute, the science of obesity is actually rather weak. And I might even call it pseudoscience for the most part. Mm-hmm. And so what is driving this aversion to fat people? And how can we rethink our orientation to health outcomes in a way that does not prioritize weight loss? That was Sabrina Strings. She's an assistant professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine, and the author of a new important book called Fearing the Black Body. So in this two-part interview, you'll hear us discuss the racist roots of fat phobia, how religion has played a role in controlling women's bodies, why medicine historically and even today is participating in discrimination through the body mass index and making judgments about a person's health based on their size. Fearing the Black Body is available in print and ebook everywhere. Sabrina, welcome to Body Kindness. Thank you for having me on. I'm so, so excited for you to be here. I was actually watching some of uh, some YouTube videos I found of you last night and introducing <laughs> you to my daughters of who mommy was going to be talking to today. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, yeah, that's awesome, actually. I forgot that those videos were out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing ever dies that. if it's on the internet, right? <laughs> that is so true. Yeah. The Eternal Archive. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I'd love to start the show by letting the listeners know how, how I came to find you and 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 really care deeply um, about bringing my guests on. And so for you, I was doing as folks do and dawdling on social media I want to say a couple years ago, actually, and there was an article that was being shared in the Health at Every Size circles that you had won a very important award or a grant from the Hellman Foundation to write the book that I'm holding in my hand called Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. And I was, I I bookmarked it and I was like, when that book is done, (laughs) I want to talk to her. And I just kind of made sure to follow you for a while. And so I was a fan before I even got the review copy in the mail. And yeah, 
I just would just love if you don't mind sharing a little bit more about yourself and the kind of work you do to get started. Well, sure. I'm originally from Pasadena, California. And actually, that ends up being relevant to the story of Mm. how I came to write this book, Uh because my family is from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia. And my grandparents came to California as part of the second wave of the Great Migration in the 1960s. And my grandmother grew up in a Jim Crow segregated, all black community, a rural Mm -hmm. community in Georgia. Mm -hmm. She moved from there to Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, she's living in an integrated community. And one of the things that struck her pretty much immediately Mm -hmm. was the fact that almost all of the white women that she was meeting were on diets. Mm -hmm. And she was like, what is this? So as you might imagine, Growing up the 1940s through the 1960s in rural Georgia, not a lot of people were worried about losing weight. Mm -hmm. So it was a major triumph just for people to be able to eat regularly. (laughs) So by the time I was in high school in the late 90s, this was something that she would just pull me aside and ask me routinely, like, why are white women on diets? Like, what? Like, what? Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, for decades, she had been puzzled by this. And so, and like, I think in the beginning, she would ask this question. I'd be like, I don't know. You know I don't want to think about this right now. I'm, I'm 16 years old. Who cares? Yeah. But later, I started to realize that this is actually a very important question that people had not interrogated before. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it was in graduate school, nearly 10 years after our initial conversations, that I began the research for this project. Because you had some element of resilience, right? Like, I can't be bothered by that crap. I'm 16. I want to enjoy my life. Like, I actually think our culture now is much worse off. So I don't know. Do you think it was how you were raised just in personal values to respect yourself? Or what was your secret? On the one hand, being in a Black family and Mm -hmm. living in a community that was integrated, I feel like my grandmother in particular did a lot of work to, first of all, provide us with healthy meals. Um, So we always had, you know, collard greens and yams and baked chicken and Mm -hmm. macaroni and, you know, like the traditional Southern cooking that my Mm -hmm. grandmother was a master at preparing. Mm -hmm. And she definitely wanted us to have a pride in our heritage and also our appearance. Mm -hmm. You know, she, my grandmother worked at Macy's (laughs) department store and it was very, very fancy to be able to go in there. And so you need to make sure that you presented yourself accordingly, right? But at the same time, as I mentioned, growing up in an integrated community, it was, it was pretty clear that maintaining a certain weight was important. So it wasn't mm. as if I was completely unaware of what she was talking about. Mm. I just wasn't as invested in the question as she was. And I wasn't as invested in the practice as I knew some of my white friends were. Mm-hmm. For me, my thought was, okay, I think it's important to maintain a particular type of figure, but it's not of the case Kate Moss type. Mm-hmm. It's more of, you know, something that we would today call slim thick. You know, you want to mm-hmm. make sure your waist is trim, but you have mm-hmm. nice, strong legs and this mm-hmm. whole thing. Right. So there was still a conformity happening, right? Which from the book, it started like before any of us were ever born. Um, there was still some rule that you were following, but you kind of fit so you didn't feel the pull, like the allure, the, the allure of dieting wasn't going to be as rewarding to you. It was one of those things where dieting definitely did feel like a moral enterprise, mm-hmm. although my, my desired outcome was not the same as for a lot of the white girls that I knew. So it felt like, yeah, low fat diets, you know, this was the 1990s and this was the height of snack whales. It was like, okay, well, you mm-hmm. want to have your low fat diet, um, with, you know, a couple of low sugar items. Mm -hmm. Um, but nevertheless you get to indulge. Uh, (laughs) so yeah, I, you know, I was definitely aware of and a participant in the 1990s diet culture, but I think I had a different orientation to that, um, than some people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting. I really want to also share a little bit about where, where I'm at. So I'm an educated white woman, cis gender, hetero, I have a lot of privilege. I've been privileged. And, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, in having a conversation with you. I've really benefited from learning from Ijeoma Luo who's been on the show before. So Renee Taylor has been on the show before. Desiree Attaway, I use her cards for self-reflection and journaling. 
I'd like to say all the time, but sometimes I'm just like, yeah, I'm all right. And whenever I'm not all right, I pull a card and I journal and oh. I get better. So I'm still very much in a phase of, of listening and learning. And at the same time, like I want to help myself and my family. You know, I've got two young girls and, and also the podcast listeners. There's helping professionals who listen there or just anyone trying to walk away from diets at any size. And I really want to help people like create a better life and outside of the personal help contribute to make the world a better place. And I would just love to know before we dive into the details of what you found in your very important, very academic, very well-referenced book, <laughs> like just, is there, is there a hope that comes to mind, right? Like when you held your first copy or was it, is there a moment for like a hope that you have now that this book is out there in the world? You know, I really appreciate that question because when I began my research into this topic, I faced a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. So there were um, my peers in graduate school and there were also faculty members that I met at a variety of institutions who thought, A, hasn't this already been done? B, is this academic? And C, is this something we can know or should care about? So it was a really strange mix mm -hmm. of reservations, right? These three things are, they simply don't go together. Was Can I ask, was there a, a race issue in those questions or was it just, I don't know, ignorance uh, is the word that's coming to my mind. Uh, it was mostly men. Okay. Actually, so I do want to point oh, gender. that out. Okay. Mostly men. Yeah. But not exclusively. Okay. Um, and mostly white people, but okay. again, not exclusively. Okay. All right. There was, yeah. I mean, so I actually began some of the earliest research on this project in about 2007 or eight. Oh. And we have to keep in mind that this was the height of the obesity epidemic rhetoric. Right. Yeah. So the mid 2000s was really the time in which, you know, all of America was sort of on tenter hooks. We, you know, we have to figure out how to get all Americans to lose weight. And so here I am saying, oh, you know what? There might be an alternative history to <laughs> what we're describing. Um, yeah. It might not actually just be health concerns that is motivating this mm -hmm. terror. And yeah. you know, so people really did push back against that. It wasn't until maybe about five years ago that I started to see a significant shift. Uh, and so I do feel hopeful now that people are starting to think differently, like, wait a minute, the science of obesity is actually rather weak. And I might even call it pseudoscience for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so what is driving this aversion to fat people? And how can we rethink our orientation to health outcomes in a way that does not prioritize weight loss. Right. Yes. So I just want to acknowledge, yes, 2007, this thesis and book proposal would have been radical. <laughs> now that you make that, those connections, absolutely, I could see that. And I'm tracking with you. So Body Kindness came out and I sold the idea in December 2014. It actually wasn't called Body Kindness, though. It was going to be a superficial book called happy hours. And I was like, no, 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 I actually want to write about something more meaningful. Um, but anyway, uh, it came out around January, 2017. And, and even then it was, I don't know, some people it's still like they're picking it up now and it's a revelation, you know, being good to your body. <laughs> so, so I'm tracking with you along with the Snackwell's comment as well. Um, I think that what I'm, what I'm seeing I just love the hope that you're expressing for the book because what I'm seeing is that there is this more of a mainstream awareness about body positivity. In, in the medical realm, I'm seeing a little like, let's, let's not do weight stigma. Let's be nice to people while we perform weight loss surgeries, right? Or let's, yeah. let's, let's not body shame someone if they come in with an earache. That was in JAMA this year. And it's like you can see the steps, right? But it's not really fat liberation. It's not really addressing the systems and the structures. But it's certainly different. I mean, when I was reading some of the history in, in your book, like I used to kind of idealize, oh, at another time, in another place, it was probably better. And, and, and you actually point out in a lot of ways how it was, they weren't even trying to hide there. Like there's a lot of diet and disguise going on now, but it was mm -hmm. just like, you suck and you're eating too much. And so stop eating in like the, a lot of the, like in Cosmopolitan when that first came out as an example. But yeah, so, so I'm, I'm seeing these shifts 
but also this sort of, and you talk about health without centering weight loss. And I think that is absolutely key because, you know, there's this message of that we all have personal control over our health, that if uh, we dare have a disease or a problem where we need medical help, we should be shamed that we, we did something wrong. Uh, And literally, you know, I mean, and I don't, follow Whole30, but it's just one example of, hey, this is for health. This isn't a diet. It's for health. But it literally says every bite of food either adds to your health or takes away from that. And, hmm. you know, that's kind of extreme. <laughs> every bite. Yeah, yeah that's, that is. Right. Yeah. And, and so it comes back to this, you know, I mean, maybe there's a question of, are we're operating from the wrong definition of health if it's going to center weight loss. What are your thoughts on that? I agree with that wholeheartedly. When we think about it, what we ultimately hope for, if we are genuinely concerned about the health of Americans, what we hope is that they might have access to safe and healthy foods. Mm -hmm. They might have access to the ability to move their bodies Mm -hmm. and they might have the motivation and interest to actually, you know, eat healthier and um, engage in healthy movement and get enough sleep and get enough water. And so rather than trying to berate people for their weight, if we're concerned about healthy practices, we can simply promote healthy practices and make them accessible. One of the things I remember having as a question years ago on a panel that I sat on at Rutgers University, someone asked me, well, if we're not telling fat people to lose weight, what do we tell them? Mm -hmm. And I thought, and I said to them, why would we tell fat people anything other than the same thing that we're telling thin people, which is that It's a good idea to get enough fruits, vegetables, protein, Mm -hmm. and carbohydrates, and eat enough to move your body and to get enough rest. I mean, effectively, we don't have to have separate messaging if the goal is the same. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And there's so many interesting insights from your book, but but, you know, being like trained in the medical model as a registered dietitian, feeling so proud of like my my flexible balance plates, right? Like here, you know, here's the sort of government guidelines, but be flexible. It might look like a peace sign if you're out to eat or if it's pizza night or grandma's favorite mac and cheese, it might be half and half. And and, and granted, clients really do find that really helpful, right? And then I read in your book about how government food guidance is really rooted in the need to control people at all costs. And I'm like, <laughs> part of the problem, part of the problem, part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that just has been my life, like for the past several years, right? Like accepting what is and trying to learn and grow and accepting what is and trying to learn and grow. Yes. And I'm also evolving as I'm thinking about this. You know, it's not as if I came to this mm-hmm. uh, in the 1990s with the Supreme Awareness. I've learned so much even in the past couple of years. And I think when I first started this work, there were a number of people who were writing in a way that felt liberatory, but they were still talking about portion control. Mm -hmm. And then over time, I started to think, actually, this question of trying to tell people to eat healthy food, but not too much, uh, which is the tagline of one of the more famous authors in this field. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Mostly plants, only things grandma would be able to say. (laughs) Exactly. So you know exactly where I'm going with that. Uh, And so I remember reading that and thinking, oh yeah, okay, well, this is the kind of thing that I believe in. And then later I thought, as long as we're telling people how much we eat, how much they should eat rather, Mm -hmm. as if we know how much another person should eat, then we're still in the same biopolitical model of population control that is not rooted in health concerns. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I grew up, thankfully we had WIC when I was growing up and, Mm -hmm. you know, when we got, when we got the delivery, we, we got more food. I was a little less hungry. You know, we were always stretching a dollar and that, I mean, I am in a totally different economic scenario. Thank goodness. I'll forever be grateful for it, but it's like that, that doesn't leave you. And so when those messages were coming out, it was like, I get the idea and I'm still feeling the elitism in it because unless we have type of structure set up where people have the time to shop, prep, cook, clean, and do all those other things, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have, we're making a living wage. Okay, then, but there just, there always seems to be, you know, people who get excluded from these messages that sound like some sort of ideal utopia. Oh, and by the way, you'll get the everlasting promise of weight loss, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And I think, uh, so some of the work that I did 
uh, prior to publishing this book was around food security, mm. which is the idea that everyone should have access to uh, nutritionally adequate and safe foods. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, something like 15% of households, so not people, but households, mm -hmm. right, are food insecure, which means they do not have access to these kinds of foods. And so when we think about the types of interventions that we can make as people interested in public health, this is where we can begin. Right. And it's only one step. I mean, as you talked about, even if we could make uh, safe food accessible, then we still have the problem of individuals who live in marginal housing and don't have access to kitchens. And mm -hmm. so what precisely do we expect them to prepare for themselves? The relationship between poor health outcomes and poverty is staggering. And mm -hmm. that's why scholars have long called it a fundamental cause of illness. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to work toward is thinking about how can we best support the entire population to have better access to nutritionally adequate and safe foods. And it's a difficult problem to address, but weight loss should not be central to that. Right. And, and it's, and that's where I, you know, I feel myself evolving to more lately is the sense of when I'm at a conference thinking about the resources that it took to get me there, acknowledging who isn't in the room. Um, when I have the opportunity to, speak, you know, being able to acknowledge my privileges or write things that come from a place of noticing and not and acknowledging privileges. Because I remember when I first started doing a nutrition private practice, I was like, oh, insurance doesn't really work for dietitians. So I'll be out of pocket. And I remember this sort of like, mm. oh my gosh, people aren't gonna, people are going to need my care, aren't going to get it. And then, you know, in the beginning, it was like, when something with a socioeconomic issue would pop up, I was like, oh, well, that's not really my clientele. That's not really my focus. Mm, and I yeah. think that that's a message a lot of privileged people in medicine and health and wellness will jump to. And again, back to that, what definition of health are you using? I think we need to figure out who has the power in the system and what are what is the work that's being done? And even though we need to keep doing our work and keep our bread on the table, how can we acknowledge the privileges, verbalize the injustices? Because that those words, it has to do something to move the cultural dy dynamic. What would your thoughts be to that? As a person who is also privileged now that I'm a professor and a middle class individual as well, I will say that this is something that is such a difficult challenge mm -hmm. because on the one hand... Also, being that I'm a yoga teacher and practitioner, mm -hmm. I can see that within the yoga community, there's so many resources targeted toward those persons who are financially able to access them. Right. Um, plenty of yoga classes, meditation, stress reduction, um, sort of dietary advice, if you have enough money to be able to purchase access to these things. Yeah. Um, I was recently having a conversation um, with a professor in public health, and he was saying to me that they're starting to realize that for whatever reason, the fact that uh, America is a place where there are so many people who are poor and so many people who do not have the ability to feed themselves regularly is actually affecting the health of the middle classes. And, <laughs> and they wanted to try yeah. to figure out, wait, how is this dragging the middle class down? I mean, obviously the person didn't say it that way, but right. I did point to the inherent callousness of the, mm -hmm. of the of the focus on how the poor are somehow making the middle class less healthy. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is that that is in fact going on. And for so long, we've sort of, or many people, I should say, have put blinders on and just focused on hitting that segment of the population who has the money to be able to mm -hmm. um, fashion a particular lifestyle of health and wellness for themselves. But now there's a growing awareness in the public health community that if we do not take care of all Americans, then all Americans lose out and not just the poorest. Mm -hmm. So I think there is the beginning of a revelation surrounding that, but there's, it's going to take a lot more work in order to articulate uh, precisely how it is that not allowing universal health care, uh, not allowing clean and safe drinking water, not making allowances for people to be able to walk on the sidewalk because there's no sidewalks, Mm -hmm. how all of these sort of infrastructural problems affect all Americans, even those in the wealthiest communities. Absolutely. And then, you know, pivoting back specifically to the book, 
how we started about like 2007 and the height of the, you know, air quotes, obesity, epidemic, rhetoric, all those things that you just mentioned would, they, that wasn't what was getting the attention. It was simply, you're eating too much and we got to do something about your size. Can I read a little part from, from your book? It's actually in the epilogue, but I think this is a good segue. I feel like starting at the end for the book conversation would be really helpful for listeners. So this is from Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. The image of fat Black women as, quote, savage and, quote, barbarous in art, philosophy, and science, and as, quote, diseased in medicine has been used to both degrade Black women and discipline white women. For decades, white feminist scholars and historians focus largely on the impact of the, quote, thin ideal on middle and upper class white women. They claimed that the thin ideal was oppressive, but also suggested that they did not know how it developed. This book endeavors to address that question, adding a much needed intersectional component to the analysis of the development of fat phobia and the slender aesthetic, revealing race to be the missing element in many of these analyses. So that was my sort of, I guess, wokeness in, oh my gosh, you're right. Like in all these feminist movements, like we really don't know. And there's enough there that you had to write an entire book on it. (laughs) Yeah. So kind of starting from, from kind of what people are uh, most familiar with, right. Going to see a doctor or maybe being, you know, going for an earache and recommended that there's weight loss. That is, something that wasn't always the case, right? There was a transition in which medicine decided to take sort of health and weight on as this thing that they were going to uphold and hold women accountable to, to control. Can you kind of share a little bit more about what you found in your research to that point? Yes, definitely. And thank you for reading that quote. I think it nicely contextualizes the points that I'm trying to make mm-hmm. uh, in the book, obviously, and then also in this conversation. Mm-hmm. When we look at the work of someone like Barbara Ehrenreich, who had written about medical sexism, what they have revealed is that historically, when the institution of medicine uh, was formalized and professionalized in the United States, one of the key groups that doctors, who were largely men, were interested in trying to reform and turn into idealized healthy citizens were women. Mm -hmm. So women's bodies have long been a focus of control and a locus of medical intervention. And so what happened was that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was this sense that American women were too slender, which when you first hear it is like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But then I'm sure we've also heard of the stereotype of um, sort of Americans being of the sort of the Yankee Abraham Lincoln figure, in Mm -hmm. fact. So while maybe not everyone has heard of that, but nevertheless, that was a particular stereotype that did exist in the United States for a number of years. And so what was taking place was that during that particular period, the idea was like Americans are for some reason just naturally slender. Doctors were suggesting it's actually very important for women to gain weight because we know that women with a particular uh, amount of fat in their bodies, uh, who are just fleshy and curvy enough to sustain pregnancy, are the ones who are going to be the foremothers of the next generations. Uh, So you can find articles about this in JAMA and about the American Journal of Public Health that are really focused on this question of how to get women to gain weight. And it wasn't until around the 1920s or 30s that there started to be a shift. And the idea was that actually we need to get women to be focused on losing weight. Mm-hmm. And 1919, I think, I think the scale was made like the penny scale went from like this. Oh, this is entertaining while we're waiting for the movie to start to, oh, wait, we could sell, you know, we're making a lot of money on these. We can get it into the size that could fit in a bathroom. And now we got to create a need for it. So let's put the woman in her rollers, holding her coffee cup, standing on the scale and saying, hey, weigh yourself every day for health. Yeah. (laughs) And I remember seeing an advertisement. uh, I believe this one was from a little bit of a later period, maybe Mm -hmm. the 1940s, of a woman in a bathrobe, just like you've stated, um, standing on a scale, looking down at it, and she's with her daughter. Oh. And her daughter is also looking down at the scale. Oh, no. Yeah. (laughs) 
So <laughs> yeah, a, a very troubling <laughs> image, but supposed to be a form of bonding. Mm. You know, Ooh. the mother is inculcating her daughter, introducing her to this particular understanding of what it means to be a woman and a healthy woman. Mm. So this is supposed to be celebrated. It's a good thing, right? This is an example of good mothering. Oh, that is awful. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I do feel today in my experience as a mom and when people are like, Oh my gosh, I have a, I have a question for you. Or I, I re- had a recent podcast with it, with another podcaster, author and mother, and we titled it, please don't screw up our kids. Kind of like that <laughs> feeling, right? You know, that, oh my God, you know, somebody talked about cheese and weight gain or whatever it was. That's that feeling that that's how that's. So I do think that there's that for the people who are aware, you know, I'm kind of struggling with body image here. I'm kind of done with the diet roller coaster. A, yeah. they don't know what to do with themselves and B, they don't want to screw up their kids. And it just, even hearing from you, I just, now I got to find that image though. I don't really want to look that idea of <laughs> telling people, this is what it takes. This is how you help your kid think about health. I mean, the countless number of people who've been harmed by weighing themselves and kids being put on diets at three and eating yeah. disorders. Oh my gosh. I mean, so, so much harm. Yeah. Can I share one of the most chilling things to me. I like the hairs on my arms just stood up. It's in chapter eight, fat revisited. And, and maybe this is cause this is like my time, but it was that it, but I was really like, this ain't right. You know, that was like my, I came out of my mouth. I think it was 1985 was the year that black women were first included in health reports. And you say that until then, like racial or ethnic like it was seldomly included in any type of medical analyses. And I was like, what? How do you not even include the people that you're aiming to help? Like that just sounded like racism and an injustice. And yet it's very much true. What can you share with us about that? Yeah. So in the early 20th century through the mid 20th century, there was this idea that we needed to reform women, but the women that they wanted to reform were white women Mm -hmm. because the idea was that we are trying to create the best possible mothers for our nation. And if that's the goal, they're not focused so much on women of color, right? Mm-hmm. So women of color are the people that they're trying to prevent from reproducing. And there's fantastic work on this by a number of authors, but I'll just mention Dorothy Roberts and Killing the Black Body. Okay. So all of the ways um, throughout the 20th century that they have tried to sterilize black women to prevent them from reproducing. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until the 1980s in which um, a Democratic Congress was actually starting to notice that there were there tremendous health disparities according to race and ethnicity. And so they thought, we need to figure out why it is that minorities, as they would have been called at the time, are experiencing many more negative health outcomes in this country than white Americans, mm-hmm. right? And so it wasn't until after the civil rights movement and the feminist movement that people became became much more invested and interested in trying to figure out why it is that people of color have worse health outcomes. So this is part of the reason why for a number of years in the medical establishment, very little was known about what was happening in low income and marginalized communities. And can you share whether it was in the book or not, what just any sort of like what did we come to find out about disparities? You know, I know it was only in the last couple of years where I've been able to learn and read that, you know, experienced oppression, experienced racism impacts a person on the cellular level. Yes. And there are just so many factors that contribute to health outcomes, which makes the focus on weight all the more egregious. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I point out in the book one of the consequences of them now deciding that they're going to shift their focus from largely white populations, populations of color, to try to figure out, well, what is causing poor health outcomes was that they thought, or they found rather, oh, well, their BMIs are elevated, so it must be weight. We'll tell them to lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. But in reality, there are so many factors. In addition to the food security issues that I mentioned previously, Mm -hmm. although I did not mention that uh, communities of color, low-income communities, female-headed households, are far more likely to experience food insecurity than more middle class, wealthier, or wider communities. Mm-hmm. And so when we look at all of the factors that are contributing to health disparities, uh, stress is a major component. Poverty, 
lack of access to um, safe drinking water and healthy food. It's, it's such a compounding number of things. And I think that a number of public health scholars have did a fantastic job uh, being able to articulate the ways in which maybe one or two of these things might contribute to worse health outcomes. But the difficulty is that it's such a conglomeration of factors that are like embedded that it's very difficult to be able to say, if we change one thing, then we will change the entire system, unless the one thing that we are changing uh, is fundamentally trying to eradicate poverty. Can I share one of the most chilling things to me? I like the hairs on my arm just stood up. It's in chapter eight, Fat Revisited. And, and maybe this is because this is like my time, but it was that, it, but I was really like, this ain't right. You know, that was like my, I came out of my mouth. I think it was 1985 was the year that black women were first included in health reports. And you say that until then, like racial or ethnic, like it was seldomly included in any type of medical analyses. And I was like, what, how do you not even include the people that you're aiming to help? Like that just sounded like racism and an injustice. And yet it's very much true. What can you share with us about that? Yeah. So in the early 20th century through the mid 20th century, there was this idea that we needed to reform women, but the women that they wanted to reform were white women, Mm -hmm. because the idea was that um, we are trying to create the best possible mothers for our nation. And if that's the goal, they're not focused so much on women of color, right? Mm-hmm. So women of color are the people that they're trying to prevent from reproducing. And there's fantastic work on this by a number of authors, but I'll just mention Dorothy Roberts and Killing the Black Body. Okay. So all of the ways um, throughout the 20th century that they have tried to sterilize black women to prevent them from reproducing. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until the 1980s in which um, a Democratic Congress was actually starting to notice that there were there tremendous health disparities according to race and ethnicity. And so they thought, we need to figure out why it is that minorities, as they would have been called at the time, are experiencing many more negative health outcomes in this country than white Americans, mm-hmm. right? And so it wasn't until after the civil rights movement and the feminist movement that people became became much more invested and interested in trying to figure out why it is that people of color have worse health outcomes. So this is part of the reason why for a number of years in the medical establishment, very little was known about what was happening in low income and marginalized communities. And can you share whether it was in the book or not, what just any sort of like what what did we come to find out about disparities? You know, I know it was only in the last couple of years where I've been able to learn and read that experienced oppression, experienced racism impacts a person on the cellular level. Yes. And there are just so many factors that contribute to health outcomes, which makes the focus on weight all the more egregious. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I point out in the book one of the consequences of them now deciding that they're going to shift their focus from largely white populations, populations of color, try to figure out, well, what is causing poor health outcomes was that they thought, or they found rather, oh, well, their BMIs are elevated, so it must be weight. We'll tell them to lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But in reality, there are so many factors. In addition to the food security issues that I mentioned previously, Mm -hmm. although I did not mention that communities of color, low-income communities, female-headed households, are far more likely to experience food insecurity than more middle-class, wealthier, or or wider communities. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at all of the factors that are contributing to health disparities, uh, stress is a major component. Poverty, lack of access to safe drinking water and healthy food. It's, It's such a compounding number of things. And I think that a number of public health scholars have did a fantastic job uh, being able to articulate the ways in which maybe one or two of these things might contribute to worse health outcomes. But the difficulty is that it's such a conglomeration of factors that are like embedded that it's very difficult to be able to say if we change one thing, then we will change the entire system. Unless the one thing that we are changing uh, is fundamentally trying to eradicate poverty. Right. Yeah. I can, I can fully support that. And even again, you know, going back to 
you know, everything's going to get solved if we could just get your weight under control as if weight is inherent, inherently controllable and, and even unhealthy. Um, which brings me to the concept of like, quote, normal weight. And we, we mentioned the BMI, right? The Mm -hmm. BS measurement of inaccuracy. (laughs) I like to call it. Um, (laughs) Um, you talk about in the book, it did not come from medicine. It well, so first of all, normal weight led to weight tables led to the BMI and it didn't even come from medicine. And, and this is, I want you to share the backstory, but I will tell you that I'm working with a teen client now who is active. So like still growing teen, active, athletic, female, and she has a gym membership. And we had a couple getting to know you sessions, just talking about eating patterns and, you know, wants to lose weight, to look good in the prom dress, just all the things, right. The like your heart. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she's like, yeah. So, you know, I want to talk to you about something because I went to the gym and this was included in the membership and here's my BMI. And I think it was Mm -hmm. probably bio impedance or something, but I'm like, that's, we're not talking about like, oh, hey, everything's fine, guys. Weight Watchers got rid of the BMI chart. Or, hey, guys, everything's fine because my doctor doesn't push BMI, which that would be an amazing thing if you're lucky to have a doctor like that. But it goes deeper than that because at the end of the day, today, there are people probably right now calculating their BMI and it is going to impact their sense of self-worth, their sense of well-being, and and likely impact that they're going to make a positive self-care choice after looking at that number. So what's the history? That's a great question. And as it turns out, BMI is a tool that was invented in the 19th century uh, Mm -hmm. by a man named uh, Adolf Ketele. Mm -hmm. And he was a Belgian statistician. And his idea was that he wanted to be able to provide a measure of weights across the population. But he was very clear that this should not be used to measure an individual's adiposity. Nevertheless, when it was introduced in the 1980s um, by a man named Ansel Keys, that is specifically the way in which he began to use it. And it's important for people to recognize that not only is the tool being used in a different way than its um, creator intended, but that also it's completely faulty. Uh, I mean, it it can't (laughs) measure muscle mass. Um, Mm -hmm. It can't account for the fact that people who are so-called, quote, overweight, often have better health outcomes than people who are, quote, normal weight. Mm -hmm. And also, for whatever reason, they cannot explain to us the reason why the uh, range of normal weight has changed dramatically over the years, which I'm also detailing in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, So at one point, it was like normal weight was up to a BMI of 30, and then it was 27, and then it was 25. And it's like, why does it keep changing? Mm -hmm. And it's quite clear that it had very little to do with any scientific findings surrounding BMI, because BMI is a problematic measure. Rather, there were a number of stakeholders uh, who would attend meetings with some important figures um, associated with the World Health Organization, et cetera, who would decide that here are some guidelines that we believe are best right? The mm-hmm. we believe being outside of scientific analysis. <laughs> and so, yeah, the BMI is such a problematic measure. And I, I also want to share a story of my own experience mm-hmm. because I too am a person who has thin privilege. Although of course, as a black person, thin privilege is undermined by mm-hmm. racism. It Absolutely. doesn't mean that it's completely eradicated. Mm-hmm. And so I went to the doctor, I think it was last year, at the end of last year, because I, for some reason, was having some disruptions with my menstrual cycle and I wanted to find out what was going on. Mm-hmm. And so they gave me a, a variety of tests, a battery of tests, and nothing came up. You know, and I was like, well, we don't think that it's associated with, you know, all of these things that we assumed previously. So we don't quite know yet. And, you know, women's menstrual cycles fluctuate. So that was the conversation I had with my gynecologist. When mm-hmm. I went to my primary care physician for a follow up, uh, he, Mm-hmm. I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, right. He told me to, quote, keep my weight down. Mm-hmm. And my mind was blown because I was like, keep it down to what? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that BMI is bogus, but even by your own instruments, I'm in the, quote, normal range. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't say any of this. I was too shocked. Yeah. But I just thought, what does he want me to keep it down to? Underweight um, by, by this silly measure? And this is how you know 
that ultimately BMI is first of all, not a useful tool. And secondly, it's just sort of masking a form of, again, medical sexism. Mm -hmm. It's like, we want to be able to figure out how best to tell women to tame their own bodies, you know, make them small, make them what we would consider typically as men to be aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to be both good for health and beauty. Yeah. So a couple things related to that. One is I have a hunch that by getting to say, keep your weight down, he got to check his box that say, please reimburse me for having a conversation about weight status Mm -hmm. with this person. Uh, That's Mm -hmm. just the way to, that's the system and the structure we have. It's incentivized. That's why somebody at a higher weight goes in and I have an earache or I think I sprained my ankle. Well, lose weight is the answer. You know, there's an incentive. Yeah, definitely. Mm, Yes. I can relate on the, the stigma that I've experienced. And again, white and thin privilege. And it always makes me feel like if I'm dealing with this BS, what in the world is it like to be a higher weight person or a higher weight woman of color in my <laughs> pregnancy? I also it was very interesting. My With my first pregnancy, I saw the same doctor at Georgetown at a teaching, well, it was a teaching hospital. Um, and because I felt very protective of my well being, because this was going to be a time in my life where I knew weight gain was important. And I still knew that, that I had this sensitive element of how to be kind to myself through this very natural and normal process that, you know, I don't think anybody is ready for, right. You know, we get, get that baby weight off as soon as you can. And the second pregnancy, I just kind of went to whoever, cause I felt cared for. Like, I felt like, okay, I made it through that experience and I'm fine. So this I'll just kind of take next available, next available. So I had a bunch of different doctors. And I remember one time I had a, both were male doctors. At one time it was like, I was told that I was gaining too much weight between two appointments. And I just gently asked, you mind kind of recalculating from when I first came in and he's like, Oh yeah, your rate is fine. They just weren't looking at the information, you know, like you're, and then in my third trimester, I was going to New York. And and again, you shouldn't even have to do these things when you're pregnant, but this is just my story. I was going to New York to walk, walk a half marathon with a friend. I've done 15 marathons. So this was, I was, this was not challenging. You know, this was a fun thing with a friend. But I was yeah. so excited, baby on board t-shirt, you know, like, <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, I have a white male doctor and I'm like, okay, I know sports nutrition. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to hydrate. I've got gummy bears. I've got this fueling plan. And he's looking at his computer and he just goes, well, you know, if you were going to be my patient ongoing, I would tell you not to gain any more weight this trimester because you've gained too much already. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah. And just not even looking at you and all the things. And, and, you know, and I hear it from client stories too. And so it's like not, you know, just you and I are having a conversation about our personal experiences and also with the greatest amount of empathy for people who have it way worse on a daily basis that so you are not the problem here. The system is what's messed up. There's a strange way in which um, a medical establishment often focused on tertiary care. Mm-hmm. Um, so meaning that rather than trying to give people the tools to lead healthy lives, they um, mostly see people when they are already sick. And so for whatever reason, even though people are coming in often with uh, existing illnesses, it's not people-centered. It's not about what is going on with this individual, how can I collect enough information to be able to assess them and then give them valuable feedback about how to become well again. It's how can I best mitigate sickness based on, yeah, a number of different things that we imagine might be most likely the cause, right? Mm -hmm. It's just... It is so much about volume and so much about what insurance companies might cover and so much about existing tools that might facilitate getting people in and out that we forget that it absolutely doesn't make any sense that every single person in America would be healthy if they only maintained weight within a particular range. Obviously, because there are many people in the quote normal range, Mm -hmm. uh, myself included, who sometimes fall ill. So um, losing, like finding yourself within this narrow range of weight possibilities is not any type of solution. Secondly, we believe in biodiversity, seemingly in every other aspect of life, except for when it comes to weight. How Mm. come 
worldwide. We expect men and women and Europeans and Africans and Asians to all maintain the same weight. That just does not make logical sense. And that's rooted in white supremacy. Yes. They need to read the whole book to learn all about that. But that's ultimately (laughs) the gist is, right? Today, we have white supremacy. We still deny our racist histories. Medicine, I don't think, is doing a good job at all in acknowledging the racist history of medicine or taking action to move on from that. No, it's such a difficult thing for Americans to do. I find it to be immensely ironic that there were so many decades of American history in which race was discussed openly Mm -hmm. as a rationale for how much people should eat, how much they should weigh, how they should look. I mean, everything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And yet now we have those very same cultural values, but the racial signifiers, the racial history has been erased. And so people are operating under the same motivations without being aware of it. Mm -hmm. And that awareness is key, right? Like that you can't do anything without the awareness. And so just people listening, participating in this conversation, it's an element of awareness, picking up your book and reading your book. It's an element of awareness and awareness will lead to action. One conversation at a time or sticking up for yourself at the doctors, or if you're a person of privilege and can take a meaningful action in your community, do it because it is going to make a difference. And You know, we are products of our culture, but we also have to work to actively change it. Yes. And I think I feel a lot more excited about the future. I feel that there are many more (laughs) possibilities than I felt uh, six years ago when I was getting (laughs) so many people who were telling me that my work was dangerous, um, which I did hear from public health professionals at that time. So, yeah. And I think that there is now starting to be more momentum. And Mm -hmm. um, there is a number of, a growing number of people, in fact, who are are believing in the value of health at every size. Yeah. Gosh, that sounds like calling your work dangerous, like verbal abuse. I don't know if that's the right term or how you felt, but like that sounds abusive. It Well, I didn't feel like it was abusive to me, yeah. Yeah. but I did feel like it was uh, deeply problematic and troubling uh-huh. because um, the individual who said this to me was a, a public health professor mm-hmm. and they thought, you know, it's very important to tell fat people to lose weight because even minor adjustments of weight can actually improve health outcomes, which I can understand that there Mm -hmm. have been uh, some studies that have suggested that, but there have been equally as many studies, if not more, showing that when you encourage people to lose weight, Mm -hmm. they might lose weight for a short period of time, Mm -hmm. but they often gain it back. And that is far worse for health than if they had simply stayed their original weight. Not to mention the problem of telling people to lose weight contributes to weight stigma, Mm -hmm. which in and of itself leads to poor health outcomes. So I guess I do think there's a growing awareness surrounding those problems. Yeah. That's the clip that all the medical schools need to hear right there. Like, you know, (laughs) we just can't go forward without an intersectional lens. I mean, it just, it can't Mm -hmm. happen. I know we don't have a ton of time left. And so I might have to get the, you know, Cliff's Notes version of a couple of things that I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, but this has been so great so far. Um, let's talk about religious roots uh, for thinness. What are some of the highlights that people can expect to come to know when they read your book? In a funny way, it may not be so much of a surprise to know that the Puritans, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> giving all that we know about the Puritans already, were deeply invested in making sure that people did not overeat. Mm -hmm. So so just at the moment in which um, there was a growing availability of sugar in many Western countries as a result of the slave trade, that there was uh, also a rise of of puritanical sense that, ah, all of these confections that are now available, all this coffee, this tea, these breads, all of the indulgence that we are seeing in our country must be stopped. (laughs) We have (laughs) to put a lid on this. And so there were a number of uh, first Puritan in the 16th and then 17th centuries, but then later um, sort of more largely Protestant reformers who stepped forward and said, I'm going to teach people how to lose weight. They were like Protestant proselytizing dietitians, right? Mm -hmm. And they were telling people, you too can lose weight so you can get right with God in mm-hmm. time for salvation. Yeah, it's what God wants. This is It's what God wants. Mm, yeah. Talk about shame. 
Yes. Skinniness is next to godliness uh, was so <laughs> going to be considered one of the taglines. Right. Uh, but yes. I mean, and again, and there at the time, there are going to be people who that, you know, born this way, Lady Gaga, right? Genetic yeah. or, yeah. you know, socioeconomic differences. And again, it was at the time we were not aware to that, but it's, it just, it goes to, sh- to help us acknowledge how far back that goes. And, and I even still see, I mean, people of faith today, right? Like the Daniel planner, you know, that was a huge, oh, I got my, you know, many congregations to lose X million pounds. And, mm. you know, it just, it is, it's like everything old is new again. And it's, you know, I find yeah. like in the kind of common language, what's so hard for people is like, well, what's wrong with wanting to lose weight? And usually when I'm with a client, I'm trying to help them understand that, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of reasons why the want is likely going to be around for a while, but let's kind of talk about what your life is like and what your thoughts are like and what your habits are like, you know, that there's, that's kind of a, a basis for the work. But I think that there's a lot of people that also feel that they're not doing harm by helping people lose weight because they assume it's going to be a side effect of everybody's habit changes. I wonder what your thoughts are for that. It's so difficult to move past the entrenched fat phobia. So, I mean, I believe that in the United States, it's ubiquitous. And all of us, I think that who are working within this particular field and moving towards health at every size are attempting to combat that. But it is so difficult because it is so deeply entrenched culturally. Mm -hmm. I think that we do have to struggle with this idea that there is a perfect weight for us that's out there, right? Mm -hmm. For me, when I was younger in particular, I had the mistaken notion that it was slim thick. If I could just look like that, (laughs) I would get, you know, um, all the interest from men that I might have wanted at that time Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, as a young person, Mm -hmm. although that's that would not be my motivation today as a queer <laughs> person. So I, I can definitely see how it seems like being a certain weight carries with it all of these rewards because in reality, it can in mm-hmm. American society. But wouldn't it be better for all of us if whatever weight we were, we could accept that and be happy with it and celebrate our bodies for all that they do for us on a daily basis, you know, mm-hmm. letting us move around, processing all of the different foods that we eat, allowing us to breathe and sort of like have a tactile experience of the world. Our bodies are a revelation. Mm -hmm. And if we can simply learn how to honor them, then we wouldn't have to be concerned about trying to gain favor by losing five pounds. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned being a yoga teacher. And I have to say yoga, yoga is something that, that helped me heal my body image. It was like at two different stages when I got into running, it was like, oh, I don't have to hate my legs. I can appreciate them because they're doing a job for me. And then with yoga, and I happened to get in a studio that had no mirrors in DC. And I think the exposure to the teachers and hearing words like, hold yourself with kindness and compassion. And I'm like writing down those words. What's that? You know, like, how do I do that? (laughs) But, but I got to have a gratitude for it. And at the same time, I see a lot of problematic yoga. But I think what we're getting out of this conversation is you must have ways that you choose to practice yoga or self-care boundaries for yourself that you, so you can practice yoga in a way that enhances your well-being. You know, I think I hadn't considered this uh, thoroughly until you just mentioned that, Mm -hmm. but yoga was one of the ways that I was able to move past some of my more problematic behaviors because I was a runner my entire Mm -hmm. life from the Mm -hmm. age of like seven, Mm -hmm. you know, people used to compliment me for being fast. And so I'd like to try to show off by Mm -hmm. running as fast as I could. And then that turned into a form of escapism and also a form of keeping the type of figure that I wanted to maintain for a number of years. So it's like running just gave me such a great sense of well-being on many different registers. And it wasn't until I had to have foot surgery due to the excessive amount of running that I was doing, because I was running the equivalent of a marathon a week. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah. Lots of miles. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of miles, you know, so it might end up being like two 10 mile runs and then a six. I mean, it was Mm -hmm. or sometimes three 10 mile runs. It was far too much for my Mm -hmm. body. And so after the surgery, the doctor told me that if I wanted to keep running, I was going to have additional surgeries, not just on my foot, but on my knees and then on my hips, you know, Mm -hmm. and I knew a man who was a runner who had hip surgery in his Mm twenties. And I thought I have to find a new way. Uh, Mm -hmm. so I went, I took up yoga and I remember very clearly thinking at the time, like, well, probably because I'm not going to be burning so many calories, I'll probably gain weight 
but that's fine because Mm -hmm. this is a different way of relating to my body that's going to be healthier. And as it turns out, once I got into the space, I found that there were so many people who, at least ironically to me, were using yoga to lose weight Mm -hmm. Uh, because (laughs) I had come to it thinking the exact opposite. I was like, oh, well, you know, it's just a practice of stretching and, you know, Mm -hmm. meditation and no, um, yoga has really become in many commodified spaces, a massive industry and it's Mm -hmm. being sold specifically as a weight loss mechanism. And this is not just in the studios. This is also in the public marketing of mainstream publications of, um, yoga journal, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I read, did you write the paper? I was looking at your research gate too. And it's like, it's basically getting thinner and whiter and younger, right? Yeah. The the images. Well, that's a freaking mistake. That's dumb. (laughs) Right. right. (laughs) It's not helpful. It's going in the exact opposite Mm -hmm. direction of what yoga is supposed to be about, which is like allowing people to come to terms with who they are, accepting themselves, loving themselves so that they might have more loving kindness for others. Right. Mm -hmm. Because self-love is the beginning. Mm -hmm. But when yoga is being used as a tool to promote a particular type of body, then it is corrupted to the point where people are seeking it out for the exact opposite reasons that the philosophy would espouse, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's it, there's been so much work that's been done by, I used to work with a group that, well, I still work with them, the Yoga and Body Image Coalition. Mm-hmm. They've done some fantastic work surrounding the question of how can we move yoga back from its um, new mainstream messaging that it's a great way to look cute and get it back to the historical roots of being about uh, self-love and compassion for others. A hundred percent. And, you know, so it's like finding ways to move your body and being open to different ways. And for you, they don't have to be about weight control and, you know, they can be about well-being enhancement and like, don't go to the yoga studio that is all about shredding, sweating, killing you. (laughs) Yeah. You know, like, fi- you know, you, you got to find a sense of community and something that works for you, whether it's in yoga or a way of eating that you feel works for you. And it's, it's definitely a lot of hard work, right? Because what we're talking about is unlearning a lot of stuff that was, I mean, it was ingrained in our ancestors, right? And so the repair is going to take, you know, you know, when people are listening or feeling a sense of hopelessness, it's like, I find the acceptance that the repair is going to take a long time and no one really knows how it's going to repair is almost comforting because it allows me to say, okay, well, what can I do in this moment then? What can I do right now? Yeah. It's the difficult thing whenever you're interested in any type of social justice Mm -hmm. of being attached to doing the work without being attached to the outcome. That's such Mm -hmm. a difficult but important lesson to learn because even as I am attached to working toward the end of racism, I cannot be attached to the immediate outcome of racism ending because it's been going on for centuries and probably it will be continuing throughout the course of my lifetime, but it doesn't mean that it's not a worthwhile activity for me to work on while I'm here. I've really enjoyed our conversation today and I know listeners are going to love it. And I just want to make sure um, that everyone picks up a copy of Fearing the Black Body the racial origins of fat phobia. Sabrina, if folks want to find you or follow you, do you have sort of a home base where you like to direct people to, or are you on social media? Um, Yes, you can find me on uh, Mm academia.edu. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at race and yoga. Mm -hmm. And I recently decided to try Twitter out, although it's a little bit frightening. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but I do have a Twitter handle. It's S A strings. And, uh, yeah, you might see the one tweet that I've put up so far. <laughs> well, I'll follow you. I'll be your first follower and I'll include all Thank the you links. So much for that. <laughs> yeah. And all the social links and everything will also be in the show notes for today. Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash bodykindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search Body Kindness and request to join the group for Body Kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. 
Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.